Hi guys, it's Mark Zuckerberg, Mr. Sci Fi, also known as Mark Zuckerberg, Space Command. First off, I wanted to thank you all for um, putting some more attention and giving a little more love to our Kickstarter campaign. We have, I think, 10 or 11 days to go. We're up to 34,000. Our target's 50. Um, originally it was 100, but, you know, I agreed that we would have 50 as, a, as an interim step. And uh, so we're not there yet. We could still lose all of it. But, uh, but I think with our fans stepping up, spreading the word, uh, you know, pledging if they can. I mean, we have some amazing, amazing perks. I mean, my personal scripts, shooting scripts. We have, uh, you can play an alien that I designed when I was 17 years old, designed and sculpted. You can uh, have set visits, speaking roles, all sorts of stuff. You can upgrade your, your, your cameos to speaking roles, etc. There's tons and tons and tons of cool stuff. Um, plus Blu-rays, DVDs, all that stuff. Um, producer credits, my God, I mean, you know. So, so... Go to the Kickstarter campaign listed below here because I will sleep a lot easier if we're in closer to 50,000 because, you know, uh, Kickstarter's uh, winner take all. And uh, so, and, and loser take nothing. Loser gets kicked to the curb. So, <laughs> so any help you can give, anyone you can alert. Uh, I'm happy to be interviewed on podcasts. I'm happy to speak either in person or via Zoom at conventions you know, screen space command, uh, you know, at conventions and so forth, festivals. So, you know, contact me at markzikri at gmail.com if you've got ideas or suggestions or want to be part of this, uh, the more the merrier. And meantime, I wanted to talk about something totally unrelated. Uh, you know, meantime, we're shooting space command, we're editing, we're doing all the things we normally do. But also, as many of you know that a lot of the things we've used in space command, I've gotten off places like eBay and prop store and so forth. And many of you know I collect books and so on and so forth. So uh, there's just amazing treasures you can find by just kind of, you know, puttering about. And um, I want to show you two of these treasures because one of the things I love about individual copies of books and original artwork and things like that is they can tell a story. And uh, I love that. I love the fact that they are unique. And so here's, first I'll show you this, The Dying Earth, I just got this today, by Jack Vance. And um, I think this is his first novel. Uh, I could be wrong on that because I'm not. I haven't read a lot of Jack Vance, but I came across this copy, not expensive, on eBay. And let me show you what it is because I put a little sticker on that I put on many of my books that are signed by the author, and it's a signed by the author. But if you open it up, if you open it up, what you see when you open it to the title page is something very curious. It says Jack Vance, and then that's crossed out, and Henry Cutner is written in. Well, why would that be? Now, it was standard uh, policy for a lot of authors when they were assigning books, their own books, to cross out the printed name and hand write in their name. But it, but Henry Cutner, you know, he's not Jack Vance, never was, never will be. Uh, so what's the story here? I'll tell you in one minute. Now, for those of you who don't know, Jack Vance was a very famous science fiction writer, not the top tier, but he had very, very strong fans. Hen Henry Cutner was one of the greats of science fiction. He was a mentor, friend, and teacher to Ray Bradbury. He was uh, married to C.L. Moore, and so the two of them wrote, I believe, under the uh, pseudonym uh, um, uh, Lewis Paget. And I may be wrong on that. This is just off the t old, old gray matter here. Um, but he was just one of the rem remarkable science fiction writers like 30s through 50s. He died fairly young. But okay, so here we are, Dying Earth, signed by Henry Cutner. Well, now, why is that? So you flip to this piece of paper that's in there. And again, it's The Dying Earth. This is by Jack Vance, Henry Cutner. Okay, and then we get this little inscription here, and I'll we'll read it to you. It's chapter four. Leanne the Wayfarer, and handwritten in Henry Cutner's hand, is entitled Loom of Darkness in, De in December number one, Worlds Beyond, this chapter number four only. So in other words, Henry Cutner wrote chapter four of this book. And so when some fan presented it to him, uh, you know, he was an editor in various science fiction magazines, and Jack Vance worked with him. Henry Cutner was a prolific writer, but he was also a science fiction editor. So clearly when this was submitted, when The Dying Earth was submitted to Henry Cutner, he wrote, a new chapter 
of, of the story. This was not uncommon. Frequently, uh, editors who were also writers would revise, rewrite, do a lot of things because the, the, they had deadlines like the writers did. They had to get new issues out. They couldn't lollygag, and particularly in the days when, um, when the mail was slow and there was no internet, there was no way to get, get a manuscript to an editor other than um, mailing it unless you lived in the same city. Uh, often editors would say, well, God, I can't make this deadline for the magazine unless I jump in and just do this myself because the, the turnaround time just won't work. And and many of these authors, of course, were writing for a penny a word, five cents a word, and so they were just rip, ripping and roaring, and the last thing they wanted to do was extensive rewrites uh, on a story that had already been bought and accepted. So, um, so, that's, so that's fascinating. So this is signed by a different author than is credited on the book. I mean, that's just... Fascinating. I love that. I love that detective, detective work and finding you know ways to uh, to decipher all this stuff. So okay, now, now we get to more treasures, and these are really amazing treasures. Now, some of you who are fans of Mr. Sci-Fi, who are subscribers, know that I often talk about my friend Ron Cobb. Now, for those who don't recognize that name, uh, I'll I'll tell this in brief. I've told this story before. When I was sixteen, I went to a publishing party uh, for. Uh, sort of this f um, sort of hippie newspaper kind of thing, like an alternative to the free press. Uh, these free newspapers used to be handed out all the time. And uh, and they had a political cartoonist who had just switched over from the free press to this new publication. And he was a, 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 a political cartoonist whose work I really admired. And, uh, and I ended up sitting next to him at this party. I was 16 years old. And he, what I loved particularly about his his political cartoons, not only were they wonderful and wonderfully drawn, but every now and then he'd put in an alien or a spaceship or a robot, and they always looked just amazing, phenomenal. Now this is, you know, before before Star Wars, before any of these movies that we've seen in the years since, Blade Runner, any of that stuff. So science fiction design sort of kind of, uh, you know, began and ended with uh, 2001. That was the real watershed. But beyond that, very little. So, um... So he and I hit it off, and he took me back to his place, and he had f 10 paintings he had just done. A friend of his had commissioned him to, um, to paint 10 concept paintings to help sell a script that this friend of his had written. Now, previously, his friend, when he was in college, had teamed with another friend, and they made a film called Dark Star, and uh, this fellow, Ron Cobb, drew a design um, uh, for the ship, and my friend Greg Jean, who we lost uh, just this past year, and we lost Cobb not long ago as well, um, Greg Jean sculpted it and, and made the ship that was seen in the movie. And uh, the director of that movie was John Carpenter, who went on to a great career. And this writer was a guy named Dan O'Bannon. And I looked at these canvases. They were just laid along the, 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 the baseboard of this apartment in the living room, not even framed. And he had just finished them. They were superb. And these were the concept paintings, the 10 concept paintings that sold Alien. And you can go online and you can see some of these paintings. They're just phenomenal. So that began my friendship with Ron Cobb. And Cobb would go on to be one of the major designers on Alien. He designed the Nars Nostromo, many other things. He went on to be a designer on Aliens, did the dropship and, and, and the Hadley's Hope, and went on to design Total Recall, many, many of the classic science science fictions, designed the habitat in uh, the abyss, on and on and on. He was just unique, brilliant, phenomenal. And he told me that first night that I met him, that back in the 50s when he was a young man, uh, he and a friend had tried to set up a science fiction company that would make props and, and, and robot suits and all these different cool things, aliens, beyond anything that had ever been done before. He, he talked about an alien suit he had designed where you wouldn't be able to tell there was a human being inside of it because of the way it moved. And because uh, Cobb had a very strong engineering bent as well. And they had tried and no one had hired them. And so Cobb then went on, went on, went on in his life and career and became a political cartoonist and, and then fortunately circled back into science fiction where he become, became one of the great designers of the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. And... Uh, Phenomenal, and we even used one of his amazing ships for the for the, um, the the Shrikes in Space Command. You can see it in the first two hours. So uh, when I was pals with Cobb, and before he moved to Australia with his wife Robin, who was Australian, uh, he and I would see each other fairly often. And and then even in later years, I ran into him uh, every now and then. And he was always this incredible, friendly presence, and uh, 
And when I was, uh, this is like maybe 1974, 75, he, was, he did a phenomenal painting of a guy on a lizard on an alien planet, on this big lizard. And that was the inspiration for the Dubaks in Star Wars. And Cobb, of course, did the Hammerhead alien and several of the other aliens in, in the cantina scene. And uh, he was hired to paint that painting by John Milius, another director. And uh, he worked for Spielberg on Close Encounters, designed a lot of stuff for that. And, uh, you know, just an amazing, amazing guy. So I'd always longed to have one of his original paintings, but they were just too pricey. They'd come in at 10 grand or more, and I could just never, never afford them. And, uh, uh, and there's a recent coffee book, uh, tabletop coffee book, a big, a big coffee table book that just came out on Ron Cobb. I urge you to go on um, eBay or Amazon and buy it. It's phenomenal. It's exhaustive. And over the years, I would collect the books of political cartoons Ron Cobb did and other books that he did, or I'd collect books that had his designs in them. But there was never a comprehensive book uh, devoted to Ron Cobb. And he was, he was always, he had this wonderful sense of humor. He had this wonderful a way of speaking. He was just a brilliant man in every way and uh, and a great spirit. Um, and I would see him work on paintings. He also did work on Terminator uh, as well and Terminator 2. He was just just great. And he, um, uh, he did this amazing um, uh, uh, painting that was of sort of like LA if it was destroyed by another bomb and what that would look like as the that the, the blast field was radiating out. You know, just just incredible stuff. And um, so at various times I would you would see some of his stuff come up on in auction houses and I'd put in bids, but I would never win, never win. So um, but but so here is the sketch I did of him. I, you can even see my signature mark, Zikri, 1974. So I was like I think 17 when I drew this, but that's that absolutely captures what Ron Cobb was like. He was this smiling, warm presence. My first book, interesting enough, is not um, The Twilight Zone Companion. It's the uh, three interviews on media and society, which a book I wrote while I was in college that you can get also as a perk um, via our Kickstarter campaign where I interviewed Theodore Sturgeon, Ron Cobb, and George Clayton Johnson. Ted Sturgeon was a Star Trek writer and a great pro prose writer of novels and novellas and short stories. And, uh, and George Clayton Johnson, of course, was a great Twilight Zone writer and co-wrote Logan's Run and uh, wrote the first episode of Star Trek that ever aired. So it's me as like a teenager interviewing these three great writers and then writing about their careers and who they were and, and so forth. So uh, you can get that now. And the only place you can get it is, is via, you know, us. <laughs> and you can get, get a, a downloadable um, PDF of it. So, okay. So now we get to eBay and Treasures and Ron Cobb and all of that. So I've, as I said, I've been looking forever for original work. And then I saw this listing about a week or two ago and it was a sketchbook of Ron Cobb and a painting, an unfinished painting he had done. And so we bargained between, you know, the, the guy and myself, and I was able to buy it. Now, what I think this is, and it was unmistakably by Ron Cobb, his, his style is extremely um, uh, specific. And, uh, and, and during this period before he was able to be a big science fiction designer, movie designer. He he did book, uh, like magazine covers for famous monsters of film and magazine. So he did Quasimodo, uh, Quasimodo, uh, Lon Chaney's Quasimodo from Hunchback of the Notre, of Notre Dame. Uh, he did uh, Wolfman fighting Frankenstein from Son of Frankenstein, or, or Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, I guess, and uh, a few other paintings like that. Very distinctive. So when he was like a young man, and so what I think I have acquired now is a sketchbook and a painting he did when he was in high school. Because i that's what I think this is, and I'll show you why. So this is the sketchbook, and it's got all these doodles on the front by Ron Cobb. And then you open it, and it has this drawing, which is, anyone who's a fan of Cobb knows this is unmistakably his style. And uh, and it has a, a like a caption to this. This is a political cartoon. The, the guy is wrapped in the American flabby flag. You can see the stars, and uh, and there was a caption he wrote for it, which he erased. And it's possible he erased it because uh, either he wasn't happy with this, or because uh, obviously when you submit a cartoon, you don't have the caption written there. And and the caption I try I've been trying to read it, and it's something like, an, uh, sort of like an expression of righteous anger is the only hope for uh, an America that I too believe in. So basically it's like a lot of his satirical liberal cartoons. Then there's this spectacular sketch of 
an airman. Now, Cobb also designed the flying wing in Raiders of the Lost Ark. So this is like an encapsulation of all his interests, political cartoons, World War II, aviation, science fiction. So, okay, so this is a, an, an aviator who's been blasted out of his ship and is in midair falling. And so it's just gorgeously drawn. And can you imagine the talent Cobb had at this age when he was in his teens, perhaps? And uh, so then the next one is just this interesting. Then he does a little, a little drawing of like sort of a vehicle, a science fiction vehicle. Then he does this odd little geometrical thing and he's experimenting with his signature. So it says R. Cobb, which became a very fam familiar signature over the years. And then here's another one of these odd um, geometrical designs. And then we have this trippy kind of like, you know, it's kind of psychedelic kind of kind of drawing of a guy with all these compartmentalized p things in his head, you know, so, uh, you know, compartmentalized thinking. And then uh, there's a little doodle there. And, uh, and then we get to the next page, which, okay, so on this side, there's like a little cartoony, so a little cartoony robot. This is before Darth Vader and a little cartoony monster. So you can see these, pretty fun. And again, this is before R2-D2, before any of that stuff. Uh, this, you know, we're talking maybe the late 50s, maybe the early 60s. Okay, and then, then here he started to work on a planetary landscape, which may be Mars. Hard to tell, but because it's just very early in him sketching it. Then he did this strange kind of thing, which is a silhouette of a person. You know, which is, okay, what was he intending with this? We don't know, but it's interesting. Then, then we flip the next page and we have another on the back of that page another vehicle very cool and again you know when you think about things like like the 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 vehicle in aliens that sigourney weaver drives the bus through the wall i mean these are all precursors to that kind of stuff and then he does a much more finished version of that drawing and it's just gorgeous i mean that would have looked great in any science fiction movie and it's it's just gorgeous just terrific and uh and like this thing, you know, uh, it has a little bubble top, which later you'd see that kind of bubble top in, uh, in Dark Star. Okay, so then on the next page, we get, uh, let's see what's on the next page, but this is gorgeous, just a gorgeous drawing. And it says, New Frisco, 18, and the door says, Lock. So very, 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 very cool. And then we get to this little, little square drawing. God knows what that was intended to be. And then on the back, it says Vineland Pet Hospital, other little doodles. And then on the very, very back, there's just some more kind of little little doodle kind of things. Okay, but now we get to the piece, the piece de resistance. So here is a little sketch he did as a preliminary for painting. Okay, now, um, if you look closely, you can see it's some kind of like weird little creature, kind of like holding a spear, it might be a a prehistoric scene might be a, um, you know, after the bomb kind of thing. Yeah. And of course there's drawings on the other side too. Uh, let's see if you can see them. You can kind of faintly see them there because I put a piece of paper over this with the provenance, but okay. So from this little sketch, he did a painting. Now, now the fun part is that the painting, obviously this was a painting intended to be used as a sample for potential work as a cover artist for the science fiction magazines. There was Astounding, there was the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, there was Galaxy. These all had s superb covers. Uh, for the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, you had Ed M. Schwiller doing just amazing work for Galaxy. You also had M. Schwiller, You'd, and Kelly Fries was the prime artist doing covers for uh, for Astounding, and he was also on, doing work for other other uh, magazines as well. Kelly Fries and... Uh, and uh, and then later you'd have Jack Gauguin. I mean, just these were amazing artists. And 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 Kelly Fries was very specific and very detailed. At the same time, during the 50s, he was doing stuff for Mad Magazine. Uh, just an amazing, amazing artist. So clearly there's an, uh, he's in, uh, the, uh, clearly Ron Cobb is inspired here by Kelly Fries. And, uh, and, and but, but during the painting of this, and it's just on cardboard, uh, he clearly either lost interest or felt it wasn't working or got distracted by something else. But here's the painting, and look at this thing. It is just so great, and it's so obviously Ron Cobb, but look at the wonderful detailing 
on the back of that guy's head, and he's obviously a human being. And then this is obviously, what, an alien, a mutant? We don't know. But uh, he's pointing, and he has a spear. And if you look, I mean, the painting on him and the hand, the way it's, it's, it's done, and, and the back of that guy's head with some kind of bear claw thing over his shoulder. And then you look at the brick, the detail of the brick cob is always so great with, with the physical detail. And then it goes this nice gradated sky, gradated sky like, uh, like in the painting he did of the guy on, with the lizard. Uh, riding the giant lizard, and then you can find, look at the other details, and clearly over there there's another human being uh, sketched in, and a, some kind of mutant, because he's got a little short arm and a long arm there, and uh, and then weird little animals, so they're clearly hunting these weird little animals, whatever they are, and uh, you know, so I, my guess would be it's an after the bomb story and there's mutants, but but God knows, and uh, it's certainly one of the tropes of science fiction. Looks like there's some like little buildings or something in the distance. Never finished it, but I'm obviously going to frame this in, in archival, <laughs> you know, mats and, uh, and 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 acrylic and so forth. But I, but it's never been published. As far as I know, it has never been published anywhere. I've never seen this painting anywhere, and uh, and uh, and so it's just so great to connect up with Ron Cobb when he was probably about the age I was when I met him. And, uh, and so this is just so phenomenal. And so anyway, I just wanted to share this with you because it's so gorgeous and such a prize to find this, just to stumble upon this on eBay. Turns out that the guy who sold it, uh, you know, he, he got the archive of Cobb artwork that was with one of Cobb's publishers uh, early on in the 60s and 70s. And uh, the guy died and his sister uh, you know, got rid of all the all the Ron Cobb artwork. And so there's still a few original cartoons of, of political cartoons you can find there. And so definitely go check it out because this is the piece that I wanted and I got. So that's about it for now. Again, remember to go to Kickstarter, please pledge, because right now we're at 34,000. We've only got like 10 or 11 days. And if we don't hit 50, adios amigo. But, um, but I believe in you. I, I've always have and I always will. My, my wonderful science fiction audience, Ron Cobb, had a wonderful life and a wonderful career because of, of science fiction. And, uh, and he was part of the absolute golden age of science fiction film. Uh, many, many of his movies are, are, are classics that we all love and all watch. And I'm so glad that uh, he's getting some light shone on him, on his work. And I'm so glad that I got to utilize the design of his in Space Command because that was such an honor. And I, I thank his, uh, his widow, Robin Love, for letting me utilize it. So that's about it for now. We'll talk again real soon, guys. But I'm so glad I could share all of this with you today. Take care and we'll talk again soon.